Hi guys, um, welcome to Barbie, A Comprehensive History, and we're going to be discussing the 1960s today. So, in the 1960s, Barbie's look changed. Her eye makeup became softer, her eyebrows less arched, and her irises blue. She also came with ginger hair. Her hair began to resemble popular icons of the time, like First Lady Jackie Kennedy, while her clothes mirrored more of the, the mod era. So I want to go over a few of my favorite Barbie dolls that came out in the 1960s. So in 1960, fashion designer Barbie came out, and she wears a tailored red blazer and skirt with a white and red pinstripe blouse with a bow at the collar. The skirt is tied with a brown belt. Her shoes are black open-toed pumps, and her hair has a white and red striped headband. She has a dark brown ponytail and wears blue eyeshadow. Then Barbie Solo in the Spotlight came out in 1961. This doll has a timeless glamour to it. She wears a skin-tight black mermaid-style dress that's covered in black glitter and flares out in black tulle. The bottom has a single red rose to the side on top of the tool. She holds a peach scarf with hands covered in long black gloves. Her shoes mirror those of the fashion designer Barbie, and her necklace is of gold beads that go around her neck as a layered choker. She has a poodle style ponytail like the first Barbie doll, and her hair came in blonde and brunette. She had gray eyeshadow and a bold red lip that matches the rose on her dress. In 1962, Barbie Red Flare came out. This doll reminds me a lot of Jackie Kennedy, and I don't think I'm alone in the sentiment. She has a big, fluffed-up, short head of hair that came in blonde and brunette. And when I mean this thing is puffy, it's like a helmet. Like, that is how big. And while I'm describing these Barbies, um, I say their name at the beginning um, of each description, and I totally um, encourage you guys to look them up as we go along so that you can really see what I'm talking about. But if not, I hope my descriptions are able to do that for you. She wears white gloves, red pumps, and a red hat, and a huge puffy red swing coat, um, which if you guys don't know the length of that, it would be a little bit above the knees. Um, she exudes the energy of a first lady. Many of these fashions I mentioned were actually reproduced recently in a collaboration between Barbie and Unique Vintage, and I'll be going over that more once we get into the 2010s, but for now, that's all I'm going to say. In 1964, the Barbie doll Miss Barbie came out. Her eyes opened and closed, like many of the baby dolls that we have today, where, you know, if you, if you move them back, like in a laying position, then they close their eyes, and if you pop them up, then their eyes open. She was also the first Barbie doll with bendable legs. She came with painted hair and three wigs in varying colors and styles that were molded to fit her head. So these wigs came on a little rack, and the child could either choose to keep Barbie in um, a slicked, like pixie cut that she came with painted on um, or they could put this pink like feather hat over her head or they could choose one of the three wigs for her to wear so it gave them a lot of style options. In 1965 astronaut Barbie came out. Um, Barbie came wearing a vintage spacesuit and helmet which were very different than the ones that we're used to seeing now. In her hand, she held an American flag. This was two years after the first female astronaut, Valentina Tereshkova, went to space. Um, and she was um, part of the Soviet Russian space um, team, you know, because this was a time where tensions about the space race were starting to heat up um, for the Cold War. And, but the first American female astronaut would not go to space until 18 years after the release of Astronaut Barbie, which I just think is crazy that when we're talking about Barbie like paving the way for the norm, um, I think that this is a really good example of that, um, especially in America, because while a Soviet female astronaut already existed, 
we didn't have one in America, and we wouldn't for 18 more years. So Barbie in 1965 got to be an astronaut, but it wasn't until the 80s that a female astronaut ever got to go to space in America. Then in 1966, there was the Color Magic Barbie. This is a pretty famous Barbie, um, just like Solo in the Spotlight. All these are pretty famous. Um, and that's something very interesting, is there are so many Barbie dolls that the company themselves doesn't even know all of them. They can't even keep track of how many dolls there are or they produced. Um, and so it's really only the well-known ones specifically from the eras before the internet um, that collectors can even know about because it's just some have been lost to time I'm sure they were very limited runs and weren't and you know we don't have any prints in nice condition anymore so it's hard to even tell that it was a different product so um the Color Magic Barbie wore a rhombus colored romper that changed colors when the magic solution was applied, which was basically just water and some other sort of powder, like scientific thing um, that kids would mix together and then apply on. And she came with either blonde hair that changed to scarlet red or dark brown hair that changed to a bright red. And once they change colors, both the romper and the hair, they couldn't cha be changed back, unlike some future Barbie items that we're going to be talking about later. In 1967, my personal favorite Barbie of all time came out, which is the Twist and Turn Barbie. Um, she came with a very thin waist that, like when you think of like stereotypical people get mad at Barbie for her proportions, this is the doll that you're thinking of. Um, which is not why I like her, obviously, if anything, that's a downset. But um, it's her facial sculpt that I'm obsessed with. So um, that really thin waist could twist, and that's why it's called Twist and Turn Barbie. She came in ginger, brunette, or blonde. She had bright blue eyes, winged liner, rooted lashes, and a coral pink pouty lip. And she just has the cutest face you've ever seen. It's like the perfect blend of innocence yet sophistication that I think the first Barbie comes across as a little bit too harsh in looks. Um, but I think this doll perfectly balances kind of like the facial molds that we're at now versus the beginning. Um, and she came wearing a coral swimsuit that was covered by a fishnet romper that was hemmed with neon coral fabric. She had a small coral bow on the top of her head, which was covered in breast-length hair that had thick, straight bangs. She came with no shoes, as this was more of a beach attire, and no other clothes, and was sold in a sparkly decorated, in a sparsely decorated sh solid shoe box for one dollar and fifty cents, which was cheaper than the original Barbie, which was three dollars. She was one of the cheaper Barbie dolls for the time. Um, as she, her box wasn't really decorated, she didn't come with much of an outfit, and she was more of like the original iteration of a whole line of twist and turn dolls. So now she sells for about $250 to $300 um, in new condition, or $500 in the box, which may sound like a lot, but even still, um, I mean, obviously, it's a huge increase in price from her original value, but... Um, even factoring in inflation and collector's value, she's still not a very expensive doll. And while there are a lot of people like me that think that she's the most beautiful Barbie doll, she's not super sought after by collectors any more than just any um, iconic or uh, widely produced Barbie doll would be for the time period. In 1968, Talking Barbie came out. She had the same facial sculpt and makeup as Twist and Turn Barbie, but her lipstick was a brighter pink. She came in brunette, blonde, and dark brunette. So this is kind of an interesting contrast, whereas before, if there were three color hairs, it would typically be brunette, blonde, and ginger. But in this one, there was more of a difference between a very light brown hair and a dark brown. She wore a knit, roughly swimsuit romper that was pink on the top, and then a uh, went 
back and forth between pink and yellow once she reached the bottom. Her hair was pulled into a side ponytail that had pink ribbons throughout. So um, think kind of of Jasmine from Aladdin's hairstyle, um, the way that it's tied and has these sort of like uh, puffs throughout the hair. That's kind of what her hair looks like. Her box is more what we see today with the clear plastic on the front and then the sides and the back um, being just cardboard. But the back actually had a small circle opening near her neck so the customer could pull out the small flower shaped ring and make her talk. And I suggest there are commercials for this doll on YouTube and it's always funny to look up commercials, but I think that one's specifically really funny because you get to hear her talk. So I think that's cute. Um, here's something interesting that I came across a lot. Um, I'd actually learned about this a few years back, but I it refreshed my memory when I was looking through these dolls to describe them for you. Um, a lot of their faces now are a lot darker than their bodies. And that's because most dolls from this era um, had a different type of plastic use for their head versus their bodies. So the head is a much harder plastic, whereas the body is a vinyl. And so the vinyl um, was more likely to fade, whereas the face was more likely to um, get a little bit darker. And, you know, I wish <laughs> I knew a lot more about science, and I wish I knew why it did that. Um, sadly, I don't, but I'm sure someone at home could tell me. In 1961... Now, here's where we're getting a little conspiracy. We're getting a little drama. In 1961, the managing director of Greiner and Hauser, who made Build Lily, which we talked about last week, received a U.S. patent for the doll hip joint. And because they had this patent now in the U.S., they attempted to sue Mattel and Barbie in 1963 for patent infringement because they pretty much could already tell that Barbie had knocked them off. And frankly, as much as I love Barbie, the original Barbie doll, I think, is a little bit too close to the Build Lily doll. Um, by the time that they brought this up um, in 1963, the Barbies didn't really resemble them anymore other than like in height um, and hip joint, <laughs> apparently. But, um, you know, they were doing what they could to try and get any money back because they were, I mean, not a small business, but they weren't anywhere near the size of Mattel at this point. And so they were trying to get any money out of it that they could. They ended up settling out of court, so they did get some unknown amount of money. And in 1964, Mattel actually bought the Griner and Hauser's copyright and patent rights so that they couldn't sue them for that anymore. The 1960s were the true beginning of Barbie's long list of, in, of illustrious careers. In 1959, she only had one job, a teenage fashion model. And don't get me wrong, this job is not simple or easy in any way, shape, or form, but that just didn't seem to be enough for Barbie. Um, and Ruth Handler actually felt quite the same way. She grew up with the idea that a woman or a mother with a job was neither strange nor unnatural. And Barbie's careers in the 1960s are as follows. In 1960, she was a fashion designer. She was also an executive. In 1961, she became a registered nurse, a singer, and a ballerina. Oh, a flight attendant too. And then from 1961 to 1964, she was a stewardess. In 1963, she was an executive again, a college graduate, and a babysitter. In 1965, she was an astronaut. And then in 1965, she was also a student teacher. But with all these jobs, how does Barbie have time to be a normal teenager? Well, the truth is she doesn't. Well, named after Ruth Handler's daughter, Barbara, Barbie mirrored Ruth much more. In describing her upbringing, Ruth states, As a 10-year-old child working every day after school as a cashier, waitress, and soda clerk, I simply preferred working over playing with other kids. Therefore, Ruth, quote, never formed the kind of intense friendships that most, most kids build their childhood around. So the question I'd like to raise is whether or not this is a bad thing, not having Barbie resemble a normal teenage to young adult to, you know, fresh adult 
lifestyle. And of course, an actual child should have friends and social aspects along with academic ones. But should Barbie, a feminine, all-woman symbol, represent a social life? In the 1960s, women were expected and encouraged to do three things in life. Have luncheons with friends, be a happy housewife, and raise children. As we touched on last week, this was a model that Ruth Handler went against. Or rather, she pushed against the notion that this was the only choice for women, stating, Barbie always represented the fact that a woman has choices. And Barbie's choice, just like Ruth's, was to work. Here's a quote from Ruth that could have come straight from Barbie's mouth, if she could talk. I'm a little lost at home. I'm just not efficient. Yet, she couldn't say this because she's just a doll. But is she? Is Barbie just a doll? I would argue no. She's a model for what young girls can be. Her limits are their limits. Ruth weighs in. She became not just a doll. She became part of that child through those growing up years. Many of those children set their life dreams, their goals, through Barbie. Many of them said Barbie helped them achieve those dreams. That's a pretty heavy thing, but it's true. However, Barbie wasn't all career. She was also given an origin, friends and families in the, and family in the 60s. Whereas in the 50s, she was just teenage fashion model Barbie. Let's begin with the family that they gave her in the 1960s. Ruth states, My older sister was a leader in the business world. She helped me believe that I also could do that. Barbie represents that older sister. Going on to be the older sister for three sisters. Skipper, Stacy, and Chelsea, in that order. Yet, we aren't quite there yet. Barbie is born in the fictional town of Willows, Wisconsin, on March 9th, though her age is ambiguous. A lot of times, um, Barbie is represented anywhere from 16 to 24, depending on the job or role that the company wishes for her to fill at the time. She eventually moves away from her parents, Margaret Rollins and George Roberts, to pursue a glamorous, a glamorous life in Malibu, Florida. It's made clear in the company's lore that she took her siblings with her, raising them in her dream house. In 1964, Barbie's younger sister, Skipper Roberts, is created in order to counteract controversies that Barbie was a sex symbol. With a young, pudgy face sculpt, there was no doubt that Skipper was a kid's toy. When she was first released, she was nine and a fourth inches tall, whereas Barbie was 11 and a half. She gradually became taller over time as she became the eldest of Barbie's younger siblings. She was originally released with three potential hair colors, blonde, brunette, and ginger. She typically came with blue eyes. Skipper was ultimately created to add a domestic edge to Barbie without having her have a kid. Because as soon as Barbie has a kid, then she's always a mother and therefore matronly. This way, she came across as nurturing, but with the separation of just being a babysitter to a family member. In 1965, Skipper was given friends in the form of Scooter and Ricky. Ricky was ambiguously both Skipper's friend and boyfriend, though no official statement was made either way. The side of Ricky's box is as follows, and I thought that this was really cute. Ricky's the cutest freckle-faced kid in town, and he's Skipper's special friend. Wink, wink. There's no wink there, but I feel like there should be. Red-haired with blue eyes, he's as tall as Skipper, has movable arms, legs, and head. Ricky is dressed in blue and red striped beach. He's dressed in a blue and red striped beach jacket, bathing trunks, and sandals. Stand included. In 1965, Barbie was given a much younger twin sibling, um, siblings, excuse me, Tootie and Todd Roberts, who were twins, obviously. <laughs> Todd stayed in the line until 1971, but Tootie eventually became Stacy, ending her run as Tootie also in 1971. Unlike Barbie and Skipper, they had seamless bendy bodies of much shorter height. They were only sold together in one set, first being sold in 1966. 
A young boy with the name Todd, though seemingly a different Todd, is seen again in the 90s, which we'll touch on in that decade. Tootie was given a friend named Chris, who, like Scooter, was a girl with a unisex name. And I think that that's something that's really interesting. Just the fact that both Skipper and um, Tootie's friends, and I mean that name, I'm sorry, it's T-U-T-T-I, but I have to mention that name. I'm really glad that they changed her name to Stacy because Tootie is a terrible name. But, um... Anyway, like I was saying, I think that there's something, while really minuscule, I think for the 60s, just that little bit of um, having the dolls um, have unisex names, I think that there definitely is like an underlying feminist aspect to that. Um, And while it's not a huge leap, it's definitely not the biggest Barbie ever took. I do think that's worth noting. Chris had a much more heart-shaped head than Tootie, and her eyes were much more cartoonish. This big-eyed look was very in trend in the 60s, which can be shown in Barbie's cousin, Francie Fairchild. Francie was advertised as Barbie's Maud, Ern cousin from England. Barbie loves the puns, apparently. She wore Maud-style clothing, stood at 11 and a fourth inches tall, and was in between the ages of Skipper and Barbie. Quote, she features a she featured a body reflecting that of a young teen with a smaller bust, flip hairdo, rooted lashes on the bin leg dolls only, and a slight figure. Some believe that France that the Francie doll may have been based on the character Fidget, whose real name was Frances Lawrence, sometimes called Francie. All of her dolls came in blonde and brunette, starting with the straight leg model in 1966, then the bin leg in the same year. In 1967, she came in the Twist and Turn dolls, which we know I love, whose waist twisted. She had short flip hairstyle with bangs until 1971. And I would look up the Twist and Turn dolls if you are listening at home, um, as they are my favorite models. And if you haven't done it yet, please do it. They're so pretty, and I want you guys to know just why I love these dolls so much. Um, I actually have a pristine reproduction of the Twist and Turn Barbie at home. I believe the reproduction was released um, in 2007. I could be wrong. It could be in the 90s, but I'm pretty sure that that's the year that it was released. Um, And mine is not a Twist and Turn Francie. I believe it's a Twist and Turn Barbie. Um, But it's, it's beautiful. It's my favorite Barbie I own by far. Um, They have rooted lashes and immaculate fashion. Plus, Francie has the cutest little round face. Um, Francie was also the first black Barbie doll. Um, And I don't mean the first black Barbie. That's an important distinction. And I also don't mean the first black Barbie character. It was more so just like hairstyles um, came in many different versions. Francie came in a white model and a black model. So, Francie had a friend named Casey, who was advertised as Francie's fun friend, love the alliteration, who was released in 1967 in blonde and brunette with the same body as Francie. Casey's not as cute looking as Francie, which is unfortunate, as her facial mold was used to produce the Twiggy doll, who was based off of the famous fashion model. The only difference was Twiggy came with heavier makeup, which honestly doesn't really translate in the size of the doll well. Casey returned in 1975 as Baggy Casey, because she carried a bag, but with Francie's head model, because I think they realized that Casey's head model was honestly not that good. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Casey doll. I'm sorry, Twiggy doll. But I mean, everyone talks about how the Twiggy doll really doesn't do her justice. So Barbie's family all has friends, but What about Barbie? Don't worry, she has quite a few too. Um, Stacy, and I don't mean Stacy, the future name for her sister. This is Stacy with an E-Y, not I-E, was Barbie's friend from Great Britain. Well, Stacy is also Maude and very clearly just the Francie doll, but older. Um, She's one of the most sought after dolls by collectors. This is due to each version only being produced for one to two years, making them more rare and therefore more valuable. During her short run from 1968 to 1971, 
Stacy had three hairstyles. The twist and turn with a long ponytail, a short bob, and a side ponytail in Talking Stacy. She really talked. <laughs> there was also PJ, who was introduced in 1969 as new and groovy Talking PJ, who also, surprise, talks. Also, this is something that I noticed when I was having to write down all these names that I had never really thought of before. And that's the fact that I don't know if it was like a 60s thing. I don't know if it was like they were trying to be young and hip with the kids. But anytime that it's an and in a title of a doll, uh, it's always an in, which I think is really funny. It, I think it's kind of the way that in the 90s and early 2000s, we put Z's at the end of words instead of S's. Um, but I just think that that's so funny. Like looking back, it makes no sense. In 1968, Christy O'Neill was introduced as one of Barbie's best friends. The same year, Christy got a boyfriend, Brad, which was the first black male Barbie. While Francie was available as a black doll, Christy O'Neill was the first black Barbie character. 1968, in the form of Christy, Brad, and baby Nancy, which was not a doll produced by Mattel, there were the first realistic black dolls on the market. Before this point, the dolls on the market were either stereotypical and offensive, or were either simply white facial sculpts, but molded in black, like Francie. Christy O'Neill came onto the scene with very obvious glamour and power, being compared to Diane Carroll, who actually got her own Barbie doll in 1969, as Julia Baker, her widowed single mom registered nurse character from the TV show Julia. So, Barbie's best friend, Mitch Hadley Sherwood, was introduced in 1963. She, like Skipper, was created to oppose controversies aimed at Barbie, that she was an adult doll. Mitch had a fuller face, but the same body, standing at 11 and a half inches. This way, the two dolls could share clothing. She had shoulder-length flip hair that came in brunette, blonde, and ginger. And depending on her hair color, she would come in different um, colors of swimsuit. Most people recognize Midge with ginger hair as with her freckles. Um, she matched the ginger hair a bit more, and so I think people took more of a liking to that, and then later on they only started producing her with ginger hair. Her face usually had a good amount of freckles on the bridge of her nose and along her cheeks, though as she gets older, they become a little bit more. Um, though some rare Midge dolls had long hair and no freckles, and I can't even imagine that. But even more so, there was a Midge doll with teeth, and which is super sought after by collectors, and I have no idea why, because that sounds creepy to me. In 1961, here we go guys, drum roll, Kenneth Sean Carson, named after Ruth Handler's son, Ken, was introduced as Barbie's boyfriend. He was conceived by Elliot Handler, and notice I say conceived, not made, he was not designed by Elliot Handler, but his general idea and overall process was made by Elliot Handler, Ruth's husband, and um, more of a creative consultant on Mattel, as we talked about last week. Unlike Barbie, who stands on her own, Ken was always more of an accessory for Barbie, like one of her cars, than a fully fleshed out idea. He was created in response to little girls writing in and asking for Barbie to have a husband they could play with. Mattel eventually compromised by giving her a boyfriend. This way, even in the 60s, Barbie had a choice to break things off with Ken if she, or rather Mattel, so desired. Yet, little girls still wanted a wedding set that they were promised in the very first Barbie commercial. This is where Ken's best friend, Alan, Alan at this time with one L, but later two, Sherwood comes in. Note the Sherwood last name. That was the last name of Midge, hint, hint. Or rather, is the last name of Midge now. Um, he was introduced in 1964 as Midge's boyfriend, and this allowed for Ken to have someone to share his clothes with, and was another couple for kids to play pretend with um, and have them go on double dates and all that. In the 90s, all the little girls who wrote letters um, would get their wish. 
kind of. Tune in in a few weeks to see what I mean. But I feel like a moment that really defines the 60s is Barbie's career. In the beginning of Mattel giving her so many careers, because that's what Ruth Handler wanted, um, and I just think that that's something that's so special and something that was really going against what they kind of tricked the parents into thinking it would be about, which would be about grooming and marrying, you know, preparing your daughter um, to be married off. And they just decided, no, screw it. We're going to actually make an impact here. And I think that that's very evident in all the careers that she had and the careers that were not typical for women that she had in the 1960s. And with the black Barbie, um, both male and female, and just pretty much everything she did. I mean, the ambiguous um, unisex names of friends and all sorts of stuff. But the quote I want to end you on today is, I'm breaking the mold. I shall have a career. And that's a quote by Ruth Handler, but I think Barbie herself could have said it. So tune in on Fridays at 8 p.m. Eastern Time at BenningtonRadio.com or subscribe to my YouTube channel, Ellis Golden Music, to get alerts when episodes are posted. Thank you guys so much for listening, and I hope you guys all have a great Friday night. And, and tune in next week for the 1970s. We're about to get groovy.